Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Chinese immigration to New York City. We have to get into the reasons why these Chinese immigrants are leaving China in the first place. There was a series of natural disasters in, in China, and these included floods and droughts. And so you had people who were losing their homes and people who were having trouble finding enough to eat, right? And so this sort of perpetuates the need to leave the country to find something more stable. A second reason was to escape the encroachment of colonial powers. Uh, specifically, the British were extremely aggressive in China at this time. For a long time, the British had been eyeing China because of their amazing resources. Uh, specifically, they liked Chinese tea and Chinese silk and China, right? Porcelain China. But up until around 1800, they had been restricted to the port of Canton. And so they weren't really able to fully enrich themselves on Chinese resources. And so the British were thinking, how do we weaken the Chinese? How do we enter their economy? And they figured if we could undermine their culture, if we could undermine their economic productivity, maybe uh, we could begin to access those resources in a way that work for us, right? And so what they started doing is importing opium, uh, the crop that is used to create heroin today, um, which is a very powerful drug, into China. Uh, the Chinese did not like this, and they banned all Chinese people from smoking opium in 1813, but the British weren't going to give up. Um, they continued to try to import opium, into China, thinking that this would strengthen their position and undermine Chinese economic stability. In 1838, however, uh, the Chinese emperor says, no, we're not doing this. He starts a war on drugs. The Chinese are like, you guys are importing uh, this drug into our culture. We don't want this drug. Uh, get it out of here. Um, they destroyed large stockpiles of opium uh, that were sitting in the port of Canton. The British merchants who lost money on this crop being destroyed, they were not happy about this, obviously, and so they turned to Queen Victoria, who was ruling England half a world away at this point, and they say, you know, what are you going to do about this? Uh, we're under attack. Um, the Chinese are destroying our crops. We have a right to sell whatever we want to sell, even if this is something that is destroying your culture, right? Um, we have a right to import our drugs, and so the British declare war on the Chinese, and they set up a blockade at the port of Canton in 1840, and this is very effective. It forces the Chinese to capitulate, and in 1842, the Chinese sue for peace. Under the agreements of this peace, the Chinese would be forced to give up Hong Kong to the British, right? This is a major concession. They are forced to pay about $2 billion to the British. They are forced to open all trading ports to foreigners, and they are forced to allow Western missionaries, businessmen, soldiers, and diplomats into their country beyond just the port of Canton. Not only do the British get to continue to sell opium in China, they have further penetrated the Chinese while at the same time making Chinese indebted to the British. In this way, Queen Victoria is a major drug dealer of the 19th century, forcing opium on Chinese peoples. One contemporary observed, China has been forced by Great Britain to accept the opium poison simply for commercial greed. In her helplessness, China pathetically declared, I do not require any opium. But the British shopkeeper answered, that's all nonsense. You must take it. So in 1854, the original treaty that was made in 1842, that proves not enough for the British. Uh, they want more. And other Western powers want to get in on this action too, the French and the the United States. So in the 1854 revision of the treaty, Chinese men uh, were going to be employed as cheap labor in Europe and the United States. And we're going to talk a lot about those who came to the United States in just a minute. Uh, free access throughout China would be enjoyed by Europeans and Americans, and opium would be legalized. Um, this is a major concession. Again, the Chinese are forced to capitulate because they have a gun pointed at them. So obviously this was not a very stable peace. And in 1860, the Europeans, they burnt down the Summer Palace and they looted it, taking um, many goods that ended up in European and American museums. The Chinese folks, I mean, not all of them are so happy about what's going on, obviously, right? They're being ruled in, in, in many ways by foreign powers, and nobody likes that, right? And their economy is being taken over by foreign powers, and nobody likes that. 
and they're being forced to become sort of a drug economy because of foreign powers, right? These are the type of conditions that nurture revolution. And so there is a rebellion that takes place against the leading dynasty at the time. This is the Taiping Rebellion, which starts in about 1850 and will continue until the 1860s. Um, but it's a massive war, and uh, a lot of Chinese folks, some of them are trying to get out at this point because they feel like their government is now um, completely beholden to Western powers, and others are like, I don't want to be in the midst of this conflict. I don't want to be in the midst of this war. The Chinese society was really devastated by, by the introduction of opium as well as uh, the warfare that uh, took place as, as different groups vied for influence and power as a result of the opium conflict. Uh, by 1900, 10% of the Chinese population was using opium. So we've explained um, why many of these Chinese were leaving China due to natural disasters, due to imperialism, due to war, due to the disintegration of the culture that, that they once recognized as their own because of the importation and widespread use of opium. We're now going to talk about how these Chinese ended up in the United States and New York City specifically. Uh, the first wave of Chinese immigrants, and when I say wave, it, we're talking about a very small number of Chinese immigrants, begins around 1815, and it's exclusively men. And these people are coming over to work as laborers, for the most part. The first Chinese woman who ever comes uh, to the United States and to New York City is a woman named Afong Moi, and uh, she was exhibited as, quote, the Chinese lady in New York City in 1834. This was not uncommon for people to be exhibited as zoo animals when they were coming from cultures that Europeans and Americans were less familiar with. Um, this happened over and over again throughout history. But it wasn't until 1848 that the first large wave of Chinese immigrants start coming to the United States. And they were drawn by the gold rush, right? Uh, 1848 as we'll talk about when we talk about Mexican immigration, um, was the same year that the United States defeats Mexico in the Mexican-American War and steals a bunch of land from Mexico, including California, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Nevada, parts of Colorado, Utah, as well as Texas, which had been taken earlier. With this new land in California, there is a onslaught of Anglo-American migrants who want to go mining for gold. There is also a uh, massive wave of Chinese immigrants who come searching for gold on what they call Gold's Mountain. Remember all the things that are going on in China at this time, about 50,000 of them in 1852 alone go to San Francisco, which becomes the first major hub for Chinese immigrants. Many of these immigrants see themselves as eventually returning home. The goal isn't to stay here forever, it's to make some money, go back to the village, be wealthier, to support their family, uh, to support their parents and their wives, which many of them have left at home. Again, this wave is almost exclusively met. But the gold rush, it can't last forever. The gold begins to dry up. Uh, there's competition between Anglo workers and Chinese gold miners. Um, and that competition often becomes violent, right? With uh, Anglo-Americans oftentimes killing or maiming or, or, or beating up uh, Chinese workers. This happens over and over again. As you can see in some of these cartoons, there was a imagination of the Chinese as less than human. From the vantage point of many white settlers, many of whom themselves were immigrants, Chinese were subhuman. Yet they were competing with white settlers in the pursuit of gold, in the pursuit of good jobs on the transcontinental railroad, in the pursuit of eking out a working class existence. From the beginning, there is anti-Chinese bias, and this makes itself known in many ways, like we've talked about already with the violence, but also with the passage of laws. Um, very quickly, it is ruled illegal for Chinese men to marry white women. Constantly in American history, our actions against countries or our actions stamping down minorities, especially African Americans and Asian Americans and Latino Americans, is, is sort of coded in this language that we need to protect white women from these minority groups. This fear of, of non-white men becoming sexual partners of white women. 
is a fear that really infects uh, the consciousness of white men throughout the country. It shows up in political cartoons and speeches, and that manifests in, in policies as well, and laws that are passed. But it's not like Chinese men living in the United States could marry Chinese women. Uh, and single Chinese women were prohibited from coming to the United States in the 1870s under the justification that they would just become prostitutes. And so the bachelor society develops in the United States based on the laws that prohibit the immigration of Chinese women and the prohibition of marrying white women. Many of the men's wives were left back in China. And so you would actually have an interesting dynamic where different people within the Chinese community who could read and write would literally read uh, letters from wives for these men who would come in and bring their letter and, hey, babe, I really miss you. When are you coming home? And these men would write back uh, through this dedicated reader-writer in the community because much of the population was illiterate. And, and so you have these really interesting stories of uh, these people who are sort of communicators getting really in the nitty-gritty of of some of these relationships between wives and husbands who are separated by the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so like the Irish before them, um, the Chinese were sort of perceived as Burma. This sort of language and this sort of depiction comes up over and over again in descriptions of the Chinese at the time. But they also didn't have access to the 1790 Naturalization Act, which declared only white immigrants uh, could have a path to naturalized citizenship. Chinese, and this would be litigated throughout the centuries, would eventually benefit from the 14th Amendment, which says that if you're born in the United States, you become a U.S. citizen. But those coming from China had no path to citizenship until actually 1943. Many working class Americans looked at the Chinese as competition in the same way that you had the know-nothings who looked at the Irish as competition in the same way that the Irish looked at enslaved peoples as competition. In, in the United States, because of our diversity, we often create hierarchies that prevent working class solidarities. These Chinese immigrants often lived in very small dwellings with multiple Chinese immigrants living with them. Uh, they were willing to work for a lot less money than some of the white workers. And so this was perceived as a threat to the paychecks that white workers were going to be receiving. This really upset them, right? And uh, you, you hear in the language of the time, we have to do something about this. We have to stamp out the Chinese because they're threatening our livelihoods. Though they were both immigrants, anti-Chinese activists like Dennis Carney, who founded the Working Man's Party, and Samuel Gompers, who was a major labor leader of the late 19th century, spoke to the fears of working class Americans when they called the Chinese a threat to their jobs, families, and security. These activists pushed the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the first time any group had been singled out by U.S. law to be denied entry into the United States. This law created 100,000 permanent aliens, leaving them little opportunity to reunite with their families. In 1888, the Exclusion Act was made even stronger by the Scott Act, which tightened restrictions making it illegal to go back and forth. Thousands of Chinese immigrants at the time were visiting their families or were on boats returning to the United States and were turned around. The Geary extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1892 required all Chinese immigrants to carry around documents that proved who they were and that they had status in the U.S. The decade following the passage of the Exclusion Act was the most violent for Chinese Americans in their history in the United States. In places like Seattle, San Jose, California, and Tacoma, Washington, Chinese were expelled from their homes, and their neighborhoods were burnt to the ground. A Chinese community in Alaska was put on a boat and sent adrift. White railroad workers set upon the Chinese workforce when, in 1885, at least 28 Chinese miners were killed and another 15 were injured in Rock Springs, Wyoming. White rail workers found out that the railroad's management was enacting a policy where they hired Chinese immigrant workers over white, often and immigrant workers because Chinese were willing to take lower wages. These white railroad workers enacted their revenge on Chinese laborers rather than collectively focusing their attentions to management's refusal to pay a living wage. This sort of violence was a frequent occurrence in the mid to late 19th century. In 1887, a group of white settlers set upon a contingent of Chinese miners who had gone up the Snake River and camped before being ambushed. Their bodies were mutilated with between 31 and 34 being killed. The white settlers stole the miners' gold and ran off. None were ever convicted.
The Chinese resisted the slander, the enactment of anti-Chinese policies, the economic violence, and the physical violence enacted upon them by a racist society in a number of ways. Discriminated against by white employers, many Chinese people began investing in property in their own businesses. They found a niche in work as laundrymen, which became very popular among Chinese immigrants. Because they had invested in property and were forced to start their own businesses, the Chinese community in many Chinatowns across the country became very self-sufficient. While many migrated to San Francisco, with the majority of the white terrorism against Chinese immigrants occurring in western states and the completion of the railroad in 1869, which will link the East Coast to the West Coast for the first time. Many Chinese immigrants saw an opportunity to go East and create a stable life. The most popular destination was New York City. Beyond locating to safe spaces, the Chinese looked to ameliorate their legal predicament through the U.S. justice system, organizing themselves around various movements. They won a substantial victory when it was declared that birthright citizenship, which was granted in the 14th Amendment, also applied to the children of immigrants, Chinese immigrants included. Legally prohibited from entering the country, aspiring immigrants from China were also able to outwit U.S. authorities in a number of ways. Some went to Mexico or Cuba and pretended to be Mexican and Cuban as they crossed the border or took a ship to the United States. The San Francisco earthquake and resulting fire of 1906 created another opportunity for those from China seeking to immigrate as immigration records in the city were burnt in the fire. Many within the Chinese American community in San Francisco, when re-registering, lied about the number of children that they had, creating spots for new people coming from China to claim that they had been born in the United States or to a parent who was a U.S. citizen. These paper sons or paper daughters were often given a coaching booklet which they would have to memorize on the path to the United States. Catching on to what was going on, U.S. authorities held many, many Chinese immigrants at Angel Island off the coast of San Francisco for months, interrogating them to try to catch flaws in their story. If they did, these aspiring U.S. immigrants would be sent back to China. Now we're going to focus in on the foundation of New York City's Chinatown. Ah Ken, a Chinese immigrant himself, is often considered the father of Chinatown because he set up a boarding house on Mott Street in the 1850s. After the Transcontinental Railroad made the East Coast accessible to low-income people living on the West Coast, the Chinese population in New York City rose from about 200 in the 1870s to over 7,000 in 1900. Due to the racism all around them, the Chinese immigrants in New York City attempt to become self-sufficient by purchasing property in the area around Mott Street. New York's Chinatown became home to Chinese civil rights activist Wang Chin Fu, who started a newspaper called The Chinese American, directly targeting people like Dennis Carney and the hate he perpetuated. Like elsewhere, this is a community almost exclusively of men. A bachelor society develops because unless you're a merchant or diplomat, you're not allowed to bring your wife. Life. Vice trades become key institutions in, in Chinatowns throughout the country, particularly New York City and San Francisco. The big three vices are gambling, opium, which of course is a product of British imperialism, and prostitution. An institution of sexual slavery really takes off in, in these communities. These women would be forced to sign contracts that would say, I'm going to work for maybe five years as a prostitute, and then uh, then I will be free. But there were all these sorts of stipulations. If I got pregnant, that adds time to my service. And if I get a sexual disease, then uh, I will be sent back to China, right? So these women end up getting punished in some ways uh, for the results of um, what happens, you know, when you're forced into sexual slavery. A lot of white folks would go to Chinatown and get high or pay for a prostitute. But these vices were never really associated with the white visitors to gambling halls, brothels, or opium dens. The vast majority of New York's Chinese community was not involved in this vice trade. However, many white U.S. citizens and immigrants were involved in this trade. The leading Chinese Tong had deep connections with Tammany Hall, as well as the New York City Police Department, who would look the other way as long as they got a cut of the action. 
The Tongs were not merely associated with Chinatown's underworld. They served in a role similar to Tammany Hall for the Irish, as they would often help newly arrived Chinese immigrants find a home and a job in New York City, as well as help protect Chinese businesses. However, throughout the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, the competing Tongs that were involved in the vice trade got increasingly confrontational with one another. A series of gang wars broke out in 1904 over territory. The press sensationalized the violence, and the Chinese, as had been the case for the Irish a few generations earlier, became associated with criminality. The violence began to wane during World War I, as many Tong members joined the cause and fought for the United States during the conflict. Much of the vice activity moved from New York's Chinatown to Chinatowns throughout New Jersey. Still, the stereotypes of Chinese as violent and criminal took a while to shake. Again, this is directly related to how it was covered in the media. This same period was the height of lynchings in the United States, and yet it was the Chinese, not the white American, that was associated with violence, murder, and criminality. The birth of modern Chinatown can be linked to the end of the Chinese Exclusion Act. In a deal to land their planes in Chinese territory during World War II, the United States government repealed the Exclusion Act in 1943. Throughout the 40s and 50s, a small quota of Chinese were allowed to immigrate to the United States. However, after the passage of the 1965 Immigration Act, that quota grew substantially. Manhattan's Chinatown began to expand to the communities around it and became a center of the garment industry in New York City often with labor conditions below the standards of local and federal authorities. Due to gentrification in Manhattan's Chinatown, other Chinatowns in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and Flushing, Queens have emerged as significant centers of Chinese culture in New York City. The demographics of the Chinese coming here has also shifted. While the early immigrants were mostly of Cantonese origin, new arrivals come from all over China. Over the decades, New York City has become home to the largest Chinese population outside of Asia. A community that you could argue began with a human zoo has grown to 893,000 people. And now, as always, a well-earned clip of Rosie. Now go to sleep. Just go to sleep, baby. Go to sleep.